Okay, so basic sorts. Uh, there are three types of sorts we're going to be looking through today, which are bubble sort, selection sort, and insertion sort. We've already done a bit on bubble sort in the previous lecture. Now, we've said previously that um, these three sorts are not the fastest. They're n squared sorts, and that there are other sorts which are more complicated and more capable, um, such as quick sort and merge sort. So the real question is, why do we need to learn about these? If they're slower, like they're they're literally worse, you know, like that's that's they're just worse. There's no real silver lining about these. Well, there is a little bit. There, there's there's very limited silver linings about these. Um, but like, why do we still need to learn them? And the answer is that, well, they're simpler, and. You know, I think it's important never to underestimate the value of simple algorithms. Sim simple algorithms are more likely to be correct. You're less likely to make mistakes. Um, both of the harder n log n algorithms, the faster ones we look at, both heavily rely on recursion. One of them kind of has to. I think the other one just is easier. So, you know, these are just simple. Sometimes simple is sometimes simple is the right tool to use for the particular job, right? So bubble sort, selection sort, and insertion sort. Um, these are not the fastest, but they're definitely easy to implement, and they don't really require any recursion or anything crazy, which can be quite beneficial. So these three basic sorts are all O n squared worst case. Some of them are faster in the best cases, and some of them are adaptive. But generally speaking, they're all O n squared worst case. Bubble sort, selection sort, and insertion sort. So first thing, bubble sort. We've talked about this twice now. Um, we know how it works. It moves through the list pairwise, swapping pairs in the wrong order. It repeats the process until the list is sorted. Its worst case is O n squared, and its average case is O n squared, and its best case is O n, because in the case where the lists are sorted, we net we um we go through this while loop once and we go through this for loop for each character so the n is here and then it's n times one which gives us n as a result yay the sdd sorts everyone's reflecting on high school it is adaptive yes because the best case is not equal to the worst case um we've looked at this before so we don't need to look at this for more than five or six seconds we look at things pairwise, we swap them when they're in the wrong order, and we do that until the entire array or collection of items is sorted. The code, um, this looks really similar to... Ooh. Yeah, this looks quite similar to what we had. Um, you can see that it's a little bit different in the sense that this one isn't using a while loop and keeping track of whether it's sorted or not. This one is... This one's actually quicker. Um, so the reason this one's quicker, slightly, in reality, it's not fast to big O notation, is that you can imagine that with a bubble sort that when you have a list like this, um, after the first run-through, you actually know that... Um, that, how is it? Is it up from high to low? Yeah. You actually know that this one's sorted. Because if you think about the way it works where it's always swapping elements and we're moving in this direction, if you have the highest element here up the front, which is like a 9, say, then the first one it's going to swap it there, then the next one it's going to swap it there, and then the next one it's going to swap it there. So it's going to like keep swapping it all the way to the end. So you actually know after the first full run-through that the highest element is actually sorted. And then you know that after the second run through that the next element is actually sorted because bubble sorts that move from left to right are really good at moving the, um, are getting things sorted in the right order. And in fact, this is actually very similar to the diagram we looked at uh, earlier in the previous lecture about sorting overview where we showed something like this, except in this case, it's kind of the other way around whereby it basically like the way we're moving through the data structure it's being sorted in the opposite direction okay so 
that's that's kind of why this implementation is different because the the naive one that I wrote is a true n squared problem in the sense that um, if you have eight items and you have to do eight full iterations, each iteration is like a full sweep. Whereas this algorithm here, as it gets more and more sorted, it's actually looping through a smaller and smaller part of it as it gets towards the end. So it actually technically speeds up the closer the list gets towards sorting. That does make it a little bit more complicated here. You can see that there's some funny things like technically it's moving from right to left and, and swapping them in that direction, I guess. Um, but yeah, but yeah. So that's all. That's all fine there. I mean, that's bubble sort. Are there any questions about bubble sort that people want to chat about before we move on? I don't think there's much more we need to say on bubble sort. Would, would I ever use bubble sort out of free will? Um, so... So... I like bubble sort because I think it's really easy to implement. Uh, as I said, I think you could teach a child how to do it. Like, follow this process. Swap until everything's okay. Um... The real question, though, isn't, like, would I use bubble sort? Would I write a bubble sort? The real question is, would you ever write a sort? Because the thing is, is that um, most languages you will interact with will have some kind of sorting mechanism as part of it, right? Now, C doesn't, because, well, I think C does. But it's like most languages you deal with, like, you know, the big ones, like Python, Java... These all have sorts built into them. They have sorts built into the language. They have sorts built into particular objects. Um, so the, the odds that you're like, wow, I really need to use a bubble sort in this particular scenario are quite low. Though if you were in a situation where you had to implement a sort, say you're writing a really simple C program and writing a sort is, is quicker because you're not really sure what library to implement, um, blah, 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 then yes, it's, it's the one I like because I think it's just really... I think it's really conceptually straightforward. Um, yeah, you're all getting triggered today. So, uh, next sort, um, selection sort. Typically, typically a lot of like, um, typically a lot of the time when people talk about sorting algorithms, this is the one they start with. The only reason I didn't start with this is because uh, we talked about bubble sort previously. Um, selection sort is a fairly st straightforward sort as well. In fact, all three of these are, which is that you have an unordered list of numbers, and I'll just, we, let's look at this practically before we go into it, and let me just maybe... You go through a list of numbers, um, just give me a simple list of numbers. There was one, this will do. Yep. You have a simple list of numbers, and selection sort follows a very straightforward process where you go through the list, you look at every element, you find the smallest number. So I, I, I start here and I go, okay, eight's the smallest, and then I go here and I say five's now the smallest, okay. Then I go to two and I say two's the smallest, because I'm going through every element. I go to six and I say, no, nope, two's still the smallest. I go to nine, no, two's still the smallest. Three, two's still the smallest. One, there's our new smallest. Four, no, one's still the smallest, zero. Yep, zero is now the smallest and seven. So you do a whole sweep through it to find the smallest number that exists. And then what you say is now that I've found this, I'm going to go swap it with the first element because the way a selection sort really works to understand it is that there's this kind of magical line here where everything on this side is what you call uh, sorted and everything on this line is on this side is what you call unsorted. And what we do is we want to swap 8 with something that's on the very edge of unsorted here. So I'm basically going to take this 8 and I'm going to swap it with the smallest element we found. So I take this 0 here, I move it over here, and I swap the 8. So it's look through the entire list, 
find what you want and swap it with the start. Now that I've moved this zero to the start, I know that this zero is in the right place because every single time I swap an element to the front, I know that that part is sorted. So this entire like line here kind of moves up there. So now I know that this part of the array is sorted and this part of the array is not sorted. I just repeat that process again. I go through it again and I go, okay, well, five is the smallest I found. Two is now the smallest I found. Still two, still two, still two, still, two, well, one is the smallest. Still one, still one. Let me get rid of this line. Um, and then still one. So one's now the smallest one we found. Okay, so now what we do is we need to swap one with the very next edge, which is five. So I go and take this five here. I'm going to move that up. I'm going to swap it. This is what I mean. A lot of sorting algorithms are just based on the idea of intelligent swapping. And then I put the five back here. And now we know we put that in the right place. So I can just move that there. And this process is just repeated. And now when I loop through it, I look through these numbers. In this case, two's in the right spot. So it doesn't need to get swapped, right? Because two is the next smallest number. So we can't swap two with itself. So we'd move on again to like here. And similar thing, we'd go through this, we'd find that three is the smallest. After going through it, we'd swap it with the six, move the six across, move the three back in here. It's a bit too small for me to grab it with my mouse. And now that's also in the sorted place. So there we go. And this just carries on. Now in reality, yeah, this one is technically, I guess, like n plus n minus one plus n minus two, plus n minus three, right? Because each time that we go through this, we're actually doing like a progressively small loop. So it's like, you know, 10 elements, nine elements, eight elements, six, seven elements, six elements, five elements. But as you know, as we've seen before, this is all an arithmetic series. And when you sum up things like this, you basically end up getting some result that looks like a half times n squared, which is just n squared anyway. So most arithmetic series end up just being like, like in reality, it's faster. Well, you know, it's faster than doing every element every time. Um, but in, in terms of big O notation, it's still n squared. So looking at the question, um, so this would kind of be like going through the whole array until it hits a smallest number, smaller number. Yeah, exactly. So you have to think about it like it's just you're applying the, the like if you have a, 10 element array, you just have to apply the same process 10 times, each time on a slightly smaller, you know, the first time you do it, you're applying it on the whole thing. The second time you're applying it on this stuff, the third time you're applying it on that stuff and so forth until, you know, you're just continuing to apply it. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, that's, that's really it. You go, you go find the smallest number and you swap it, you swap it down to the sorted section. Um, there's probably, a, I probably included a graphic of this in the slides, I'm guessing, here, which will, you know, one's the smallest, so we swap it. Um, two's the smallest, so we swap it. And you can you can see that that sorted edge is just moving through from the left to the right here. And that's what the gray is. The gray is the sorted section. Um, and that's how a selection sort works. And then you get to the end, and then it's all sorted. Uh, that's really it. The code for a selection sort is also relatively straightforward in the sense that um, if you have a five element list, you need to do four sweeps. Now, that, that makes sense because once you've gotten to the final elements, this is the third sweep, and then we do the fourth sweep. Once you've done that, if there's only one element left, just by the logical nature of this algorithm, the last element is in the right spot. Because if we've been swapping all of the smallest elements down, the last element that exists is the is the biggest element, and it's already at the end. So that's why when you look at this this algorithm, um, the outer loop is going between um, low or zero and high minus one. So in this case, for a list of yeah, I think that sounds fine. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Cause like if you have zero, one, two, three, four, they're your five indexes, you go zero, one, two, three. So you're looping while it's less than four. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. I'm confused. Anyway, forget that for a sec. We'll look at it in the code. Um, the idea is that every time you do a sweep, you pick a, you, you find the minimum value, right? 
Now, by default, the minimum value is just going to start at some low number and then you go through it all. Um, sorry, let me just double check. I haven't... Yeah, you go through it all and you're essentially now just checking like... Um, is each, like for each element, you check if it's smaller than the min. And if it's smaller than the min, you set it. Like we've written these functions before. You, you've probably written them in 1511. You go through a list, you find the minimum number. Like all this really is here is a glorified way of finding the, the index of the minimum element. And then once you've found the index of the minimum element, you simply do a swap. So when someone asked before about bubble sort, it's like this code here makes sense to me. It's not the hardest thing, but it's also like, it's a lot of dealing with indexes and, and moving stuff up. So people again asked why uh, we like bubble sort. Um, well, I, why I like bubble sort. It's because it's, again, it's, it's for a child and I like being a child. It's, it's simple. So this makes sense though. I would be likely to probably have a fence. If I was to just write this quickly, I would probably have a fence post error. I'd probably miss something. I'd feel like I want to test it for more values. Um, uh, Jay says, for style, are we allowed to use single line if statements? I think it looks clean, but not sure about 2521. Um, look, I don't remember what's in the style guide off the top of my head. I'm not sure if it gives a ruling on that. That's that's the what it says is more important than what I say. Um, you've probably looked at this more than me this term. Like I, I've looked, at, I had a good look at it at the start of the term, but since I don't do a lot of the marking, I can't remember. The, the short story is that a lot of the code that I took from previous offerings of this course had quite a lot of one-line statements in it. Um, I've been converting most of those. The main reason for that is because I generally find that what students do... I was talking to some mature age students about this recently, actually, is that um, you learn how to program, right? And you learn how to do stuff. And then you start to feel good, right? You might get to the end of 1511 and you feel like, yeah, I can write C. Maybe I don't feel confident. And then you learn more things you can do. And you're like, oh, I can do this sneaky ways. I can do this faster ways and, you know, more concise ways. And what ends up happening is that you can get so easily excited by the fact that you can write things concisely that it's really easy to not really ask yourself if it actually makes the code more readable. Um which is a big thing in my book because like one of the other problems is that for many of you, uh, you've written like your ratio of code that you've written to the ratio of code that you've read or the ratio of code that you've written that other people have to read is extremely small, right? Like in terms of like with me, um, I read a lot more code than I write these days and I probably have code I write read more than I write it if that made sense. And that that's just starts to happen naturally as you do more group work subjects, as you get older and you deal with more complex code bases. And at that point, you start to realize that actually what you thought was clean in the moment was actually just your brain thinking you're a genius and look how cool this looks and how sneaky and smart and concise this looks. Whereas in, in, in reality, it's, it's not always the case. Now, I'm not saying that means that all one line if statements are bad, um, I don't think that's the case at all. There's definitely a lot of time and place for um, one-liners and removing braces, though there have been some pretty hilarious programming errors that come from people doing something like this, um, etc. So my general advice is just, we just, tell, we just don't really tell you to use it um, because... The, the, the upside is that you might write some slightly more concise code. The downside is that will turn you into programmers that no one can read your code, right? Um, though the short answer, sorry to take this one on a tangent, is like, it's not outright terrible. I don't think we've banned it. I don't, I don't think there's been anything like that. It's just like, when you use it, it's like, it's one of those things that you should really make sure makes sense. In fact, there are some instances that we have used it, such as like, in, in the tree examples, sometimes you'll see us do things like, say, um, oh, you know, like in a traverse for a, a, a tree T or something, you'll see us say, like, if T equals null return or, like, if T equals null return T or, or something like that. It's like that line, yeah, it, well, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this gets into some coding preferences here because then you might say, oh, we'll traverse T left and traverse T right, okay, but... It's like, which looks better? Does that look better? Or does it look better to simply go, um, 
you know, is it to simply do the negation of that and then just wrap it inside a, you know, a statement like that. Like, which one is kind of cleaner and better? I mean, this is, the, like, this is a somewhat probably open for debate question. I don't think I have a strong view on that at a personal level. Um, I think that this one is nicer because there's literally less code you're dealing with here, though it may not be obvious to someone reading it that there's technically a, a skip case, which is what this early return is here. And also indentation can make code harder to read. But that being said, if you go look at programming purists, early returns are essentially jumps in your code at this level of abstraction that can make code really confusing because you can't reason with code anymore. Um, so these are these are areas where it's fine. The problem is where does it slip from this into something that's suddenly like really hard to read? You know, the thing I don't like about this is that I don't look for statements hiding over on the right-hand side of my code. So like this here feels kind of tucked away and not obvious. It's not where my eyes are looking for it as someone who's read a lot of code. Does that mean it's bad? I don't know. It feels very borderline to me and I'm not I'm not here to make massive subjective judgments about what's okay and not okay. I'm just trying to explain the space you can explore on this topic. Um, but then again, it's like, you know, some people say, oh, I'll do this then. Okay, that makes sense. It's indented correctly. I just don't want to include the braces because if I include the braces, then now I've got a whole extra line. And it's like, I don't, I don't love this approach. It's like, if you, if you need to include it on the next line, it kind of tells me that this line is too complicated to be like a single line thing. Again, there's also been cases in the past, I think, I, I don't know if I told you this at the start of the course. If I did, I'm really sorry, but there was like the go-to Apple bug that I, I can't remember where um, there was a big problem because um, someone had code that looked like this. I, I honestly read this for like 30 seconds, but I got the point of it. It was just like, um, there was like a duplication of a line here or something like that. But the way that programs work is when you have a when you have a condition that doesn't have braces, it's only the very next statement that forms part of that if statement. So what was actually happening here was that it was checking this condition, and then this part here was um, tied to that condition if it was true. But then this part here was technically like it was unindented, effectively conceptually, right? It was like it was always going to fail. Um, and it's like, why would you risk that? Why would you bother potentially creating that mistake when you don't have to? Um, you know, my um, one of one of my one of my favorite statements on code quality is still just the the line. Um, what is it? It's like, you know, code is for humans. And I mean, you all kind of know this after doing. I think you've had to do 1521 before this course, right? It's like you've dealt with MIPS and this kind of stuff. And it's like, <clears throat> we didn't invent C and we didn't invent these other languages to be um, super sharp with our expression and like make things as concise as possible. Um, we, we invented programming languages so that humans could read code fundamentally right like otherwise we'd still be working with much faster languages that don't have abstractions and overheads and all this other stuff oh well, sorry i don't know how the programs work but for those who haven't done one i haven't done one five two one either so welcome to the to the boat um yeah so the point is like you write like the code exists for humans otherwise you'd be writing everything in assembly and just keep that in your mind because like every time you ask yourself something it's like it, does this make it more consumable by another human who has not seen this before. And if the answer is not yes, then don't do it. You know, like this is a very ugly, this is a very ugly, I mean, you can't do much with this one because like fundamental algorithms, you often just kind of need to use I's and J's, but um, you know, like there's no point putting, oops. There's no point having this just be called S or something. Like, what is that gonna do? You're like, oh wow, I saved some lines in my source code. It's like, great. No one's going to like you, though, so keep that in mind. Anyway, that was a massive tangent. I really want to get through this lecture before the break, so we're going to keep going. I know some of you might be pining for it, but I don't want to pause it. I could, I guess. Anyway, let's see how we go. So that's selection sort. Go through it, find the smallest, swap it. Done. Um, insertion sort, which is the last kind of sort we're going to look at. Oh, by the way, this one is not adaptive because the best case and the worst case is the same because... 
think about how this one works. If you have all of your elements already sorted, like you have one, two, three, four, five, these are the worst numbers I've ever drawn in my life. Like this, the way that the selection sort algorithm works is it, is it goes, oh, one's the smallest I found, but it still has to check each and every one of those elements each time. And then after it's checked it, it says, great, one's locked in, sorted. And then it says two. Okay, two's the minimum. Is this smaller? No. Is this smaller? No. Is this smaller? No. So even if the list is already sorted, selection sort is not an adaptive algorithm. It still um, uh, takes exactly n squared time. And that's just something to keep in mind because it's not perfect. Insertion sort though, the third sort we're looking at um, is kind of similar to bubble sort in that it's an adaptive algorithm with the best case of ON. And uh, this one conceptually is, I guess also, it's not too bad. It's definitely easier than the other sorts we're going to look at. Um, but basically, what happens, and this one always eludes my brain a little bit, but I think I'm okay. Um, well, I don't know, unsorted list. I don't know why I don't. Sorry that I just randomly decide to Google these things sometimes. Um, I'm always, always have that aspect ratio off, don't I? Okay, so say we have an unsorted list. The way insertion sort says to work is that take your first element and assume that it's sorted. Okay, sweet. Um, so we kind of draw that magical line of sorted, unsorted here. And then what it says is go, go to your next element in your list, essentially take it and try and insert it into the sorted section in the right spot. So in this case here, it's like, okay, well... With you have two numbers, 33 is already in the right spot. So then we move this here. So there's our new sorted line. So what we've got is we've got this is now sorted and everything on the right is unsorted. So we take the next element here and we try and put 27 in the right place in these numbers. Now, typically what that entails is a series of swaps again, where you swap 27 with the next number until it's in the right place. And you keep swapping it down and down until it's in the right place. So now this is in the right place and these three numbers are sorted. Okay, so what you're doing is you're taking the next number and you're inserting it into the right spot. So a similar thing here, if 10 is my next number and I need to insert it into the correct spot in my sorted list, I'm going to take 10 out, I'm going to swap it with 33. Okay, so 10 has been swapped there. Then I'm going to swap it with 27. And then I'm going to swap it with 14. And now this one's sorted. So now we've got a sorted list of four elements. And then, you know, we're going to have a sorted list of that, and then this, and then that, and then that. So, you know, you keep taking them one by one and moving them across. Now, um, that's the algorithm. Uh, we could watch it here, right, where you, you assume six are sorted, okay? And then you take five and you, you try and slide it into the right spot. The challenging part about insertion sort is that it involves a lot of array shifting because you, when I say array shifting, it's more like doing lots of swaps because you can see here we're kind of having to like shift these elements along. So the complexity of an insertion sort is kind of the opposite of a selection sort. A selection sort spends a lot of time doing searching for the right element, but it swaps it really quick. An insertion sort finds the next element, the eight, nearly instantly, and it spends most of its time actually putting it in the right spot. So similarly here, you know, seven needs to get put in the right spot and then it'll do two as well. Now, this is also clearly an adaptive sort because if you have your entire list sorted at the start, it doesn't need to do any swaps, right? And we saw this like with one of our very first swaps where we had 14 and 33, where we were like, oh, okay, we need to move 33 into this like sorted list, but it's already in the right spot. So for a totally sorted list, it just kind of goes tick, 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 tick. So insertion sort's very quick for a, a already sorted list. It has a very quick best case. So that's an example where if you're sorting numbers that you think are already probably sorted, an insertion sort is a really good sort to use. Um, and in fact, like you can think more about how these sorts work. And you know, people always say like, why are we learning these different things and stuff? And it's like, you imagine you go for a, a, an interview at a company and they give you a whole bunch of numbers. And they say, what sort would you use if you knew that a lot of the sorts would be acting on numbers of these types? 
you know, and you're going to think, well, okay, those numbers look really already sorted. So maybe I'd use a bubble sort or an insertion sort because it has a really good best case. And then you'd look at how they're laid out and you'd think, well, a bubble sort's going to have to do lots of swaps, constantly swapping it down. Um, so, you know, you maybe look at the layout. Think about how an insertion sort behaves when you have one rogue number at the wrong end. Like if you have the number one down here versus a bubble sort. Um, you know, they're similar, not similar. Like that's kind of the reason we learn these things is so that you can reason with situations based on the knowledge you have. Um, Jay says, if this algorithm is adaptive, why is the worst case and average case still the same? Or do adaptive sorts only improve best case? So the challenging thing about time complexities when it comes to um, average case is that typically for a lot of algorithms like this, the worst case is n squared. The average case is a half n squared and the best case is n. Um, and if you think about these in terms of absolute numbers, right, you think about worst case, which if n, let's say n is 10, then the worst case is 100 operations. This one is 50 and then this one is 10. So, you know, people might intuitively say, well, why is average case n squared then? Technically, it should be nearly... Um, the, like it's in between in the, in this description it's even closer to best case uh but the problem is that's just not how the theoretical math works out um because like when we say average case it's like you know a half n squared is still an n squared like if you follow the big o notation it's like a half n squared is still just an n squared algorithm with a coefficient out the front um because most average cases again are just n plus n minus one plus n minus two all the way down to one and then you end up googling arithmetic series because you went to high school a long long time ago and you look at that and you say all right well it's a the first term plus n minus one d where d in this case the common difference is one um common difference is what is it n someone help me out i'm really bad at math um what was it a plus n minus one d Right, and like if A is your first term, <laughs> I know how to do this intuitively. I haven't looked at the formula for a while. Sequence. I was thinking, I was like, isn't it like N plus one on, there it is. That's what I'm looking for. That looks friendly, right? That's what I want, right? Yeah. Some of the first N terms is N on two, A plus A. Thank you. Yeah, n plus 1, thank you, that's what we want. So, we've got, what is it? n, n plus 1 on 2. You know, and this ends up being like, you know, sure, this ends up being effectively whatever it is, like a, a half n squared um, plus a half n, you know? And it's like, why is that n squared? Well, it's because that's what the big O notation rules say, you know? And because even though in reality it's probably halfway between the best case and the worst case, like, we have a model. The model's big O notation. If you don't like the model, if you think it's not descriptive enough, you find a more descriptive model. The reason the big O notation model is, is, is useful is because it just it generalizes things really well for large inputs. Um, and gives you a, a, a general behavior of the pattern. And basically what it's saying is like, you know what, average case might be twice as quick as worst case, but it's still only twice as quick. And as we learned about last week with PNNP and stuff, um, often when you're dealing with algorithms, an algorithm that is twice as slow in the worst case is basically the same time in the grand scheme of things. Like again, if you, need, if you do something that takes seven minutes, taking 14 minutes, is, it's all going to be the same kind of problem. Like often you're writing things that either need to take milliseconds, seconds, minutes, hours, like you don't really care about the specific number. Um, I've never come across a time in my life when someone's been like, this script takes 50 minutes to run and someone's been like, I need it to take 20. I mean, there's a few situations, but they're very rare, right? Like often, often it's like, it takes 50 minutes. We need this to happen in less than a second, um, which is why Big O is useful because like it's, it's, it's able to help you categorize vastly different um, algorithm um, yeah, 
So when I said a half n squared before, I remember that it's roughly this. I just forgot what the, the second n component is. But yeah, we get rid of lower order components. We get rid of coefficients. We end up with, with a half n squared. Um, there's the insertion sort code. You can like... Basically, insertion sort code is just grab each element and just shift it down through the array. So, this here is the shifting. This here, this here is the, the shifting the elements. Um, and then this here is actually inserting the elements. So, if you look back here, the actual shifting where you saw them sliding across is this part here. And the part where you saw the value go in finally is this part here. Um, but again, you can kind of go look through that in your own time. I don't need to dictate that to you. If, if you're curious how it works, you can you can put in like a print array function every loop. Like that's one, like if you're ever like, oh, I don't understand how this works. It's like really easy. You just open it up, paste it in, um, call it, and then do like a, you know, like a print array, a high, like you make a print array function that just loops through it and you just print it, print it every time and you'll see how it changes. and Maybe I'll just really quickly do that for you right now so you can see how like easy it is to make sense of these things yourself. So we had our bubble sort, we had our, in, our selection sort. Now we're looking at our insertion sort. I'm gonna take this here, which is the code I wrote. I'm gonna make my own print array function, which will take in a pointer to an integer array and it'll take in the size. Um, well, yeah, it'll take in the size and then we just print it out. So I might print it out here. I might say print array A there, and then we'll print it out inside the function here. See if that works. Probably not. Oh, print array. Got to put it at the top. Or forward declare it. I think in general, the style guide should say something about your main function being at the top. Um, and then we have our less function, which we don't really need. Yeah, so like this is a great way to understand it. So, you know, I've got my, I think my print array function's broken though. I'm not printing out enough. Well, in this case, it should be high plus one. Yeah, so you can see we got five, three, four, one, two. Um, you can see that after the first insertion, the three has been moved. So like this is the, this is the sorted bit now. Right, and then the next one we take the four and we put it, and so the sorted bit's growing, and then we take the one and we put it, and the sorted bit's growing, and then we take the two and we put it, and the sorted bit grow sorted bit grows. Like, you can just print stuff out and have a look at how it works. You know, if you don't understand stuff, you can tinker and play, and you'll get your head around it in a way that makes the most sense to you as well. Um, and don't be afraid if you don't get it the first time either, because sometimes you just need to go away and think about it. I think that's nearly it for the basic sorts. This is a little um summary table it's probably not like the most interesting thing in the world but it, it just says exactly what we've seen before um, the difference between compares swaps and moves is not technically that relevant in terms of it's not like swaps are substantially more complex than moves or compares or whatever but you can see the general pattern here is that um, you know at least with a bubble sort your if it's totally sorted, then you don't actually do any swaps, technically. I mean, but again, this depends on the implementation. So this is more just if you're curious about things. But generally speaking, I think the top slides for all these are pretty fine. The adaptability, the best case, worst case, and average case. Um, yes. There was more about this in previous terms lectures, uh, but I decided not to go into it because I just thought it was a bit of a distraction and there's already so much in this course is like you can do sorting on linked lists for many instances um, and a big part of that is because sorting is sorting on linked lists is possible if all you're doing is um, like swaps and stuff like swapping is pretty easy to do so so yeah um, you can do it on a linked list if you want to try um, that that could be a you know, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't really gotten into exam mode yet, but, you know, sorting on a linked list could be like a really hard exam question if we wanted to make things hard because it's still very doable and your, your, you know, your bank of knowledge is just wouldn't be very straightforward.
um, if you haven't done it before. But you can do a lot of these things on Linkless if you just sit down and think about it. Um, and yeah, if you could leave some feedback for um, basic sorts, that would be great. And then we'll take a break and we'll get stuck into... Actually, while you're leaving feedback, did people want to... Do people want to talk about assignment three today, the last part, or um, do we want to keep talking about sorting and talk about assignment three tomorrow? The part. <laughs> do people want to talk about part three of assignment two this afternoon? I only really, I don't have much to say on it. Or did you want to keep going on sorting and talk about part three of assignment two tomorrow? Uh, your feedback depends on whether exam has linked list sorting. Um, look, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not being evil here. I haven't thought about the exam for this course at all, um, at all. And I will take my guidance from tutors and Kevin because they've seen this exam. They've sat these exams more recently as students. So, um, you know, I, I like, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not like being like, oh, this is going to be in the exam. I don't know. I'm just telling you, like as someone who's written a lot of exams, I was like, that sounds like a really good hard question because you understand linked lists, you understand sorts. And at the top end, the very highest end of students, you typically expect them to be able to combine concepts together um, in a simple way, relatively well, right? I was just, it was a very academic comment. Please don't overthink it. Um, you know, so... You're only stressed because I haven't said this about anything else in the course, but it's fine. Don't 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 freak out about it. Um, anyway, let's take a let's take a five minute break and then we'll we'll get into we'll probably do merge sort today. So let's talk about merge sort and then we'll we'll finish off quick sort tomorrow and um, talk about part two part oh, part three of assignment two tomorrow. It'll probably be a shorter lecture tomorrow. We'll see how we go. Um, but yeah, five minute break. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>